Welcome everyone for session two of our uh, CAVE Symposium that is a, a joint uh, operation between the Virginia CAVE Board and the New Market Library. And I am very pleased to welcome as our next speaker, Dr. Dan Doctor. And Dan uh, is the current chair of the Virginia CAVE Board. I won't go through your entire uh, introduction, Dan, uh, did that earlier and did it in the material sent out, but we are looking forward to hearing you talk about the geology of caves. And at this point, I think I'll mute everyone and then we'll let Dan unmute to speak. So Dan? All right, <clears throat> and I will share my screen. All right, I believe I'm unmuted. Very good. Um, can everyone see the screen? I see some heads shaking, yes, okay, thank you. Uh, thanks, Bev, for organizing this. Um, I, uh, I'm pleased to be here. I'm gonna talk a little bit about uh, what is karst. Um, I got to the first slide already. Um, the title is What Lies Beneath uh, the Geologic History of the Shenandoah Valley Karst. And uh, I'm gonna to try to keep it to the Shenandoah Valley as much as possible, but we'll talk more about karst in general and, and uh, some areas in, in Virginia that have karst as, in addition to the Shenandoah Valley. And I, I have to acknowledge my colleagues down here, uh, Will Orndorff, of course, uh, some of you have already met him and he'll be speaking after me. So I definitely hope everyone will stick around for that. Should be really great and fascinating. And I'm looking forward to hearing more about uh, life in caves. Um, from him, Bob Denton, who's a, another Virginia K board member and a colleague, um, and Steve Whitmire, who's a professor at James Madison University in Harrisonburg. Uh, one of the questions that came through on the chat earlier was, what is KARS? It just happened to be my first slide. I got up there a little early, but um, there's, a, there's a definition. It's funny, if you ask uh, any number of, of geologists or KARST experts even, they, you may have uh, slightly different worded definitions. Um, but they all basically have what in common that the uh, karst, karst areas are underlain by bedrock that is um, more soluble in water than most rock types. Um, and in particular, there are two kinds of, of rock types that uh, are, are historically, or in, in general, they, they yield karst areas, and that's uh, carbonates um, and evaporites. Carbonates are uh, limestones and dolostones. Evaporites are, are um, sedimentary deposits that form from the evaporation of water, such as you might find in a shallow sea or a shallow lake um, that eventually over long periods of time may, may completely um, evaporate away and leave behind salts, um, sometimes just true sodium chloride or, or halite salts, um, but other types of salts, gypsum and anhydrite, which are um, calcium sulfates. And the, the real uh, definition comes down to whether uh, you, you uh, to sense in some people's minds, the definition comes down to whether or not you see expressed at the land surface uh, features like sinkholes, uh, closed depressions, and caves and springs and sinking streams. Um, but I, I think that we ought to consider the definition to go a little bit broader than that, um, to just encompass any place you have these rock types, because often, there will be solutional features in the subsurface that won't express themselves on the surface. And so with that in mind, uh, my colleague Dave Weary and I put out a map um, in 2014 showing that there's really an awful lot of karst in the United States. And it's, uh, it's essentially a geologic map showing the occurrence of those rock types, the carbonates and the evaporites, plus some other rocks that um, host caves that are karst-like in their uh, function in terms of their uh, hydrology, which include lava tubes in basaltic rocks, most of which you'll find out in the western United States. And if we add up all those areas, it comes to about 18% of the land area of the United States is, uh, has the potential to host karst. And um, that's including just the carbonate and evaporite rocks. These other 
uh, types of, of karst terrain uh, are, are smaller percentages, um, but they also, they also host caves. Um, the term karst actually is a, is a word that originated in the country of Slovenia and uh, highlighted Slovenia here in, in Europe. It's sort of on the edge of the Adriatic Sea, just in the northeast corner, just to the um, <clears throat> northeast of Italy. And uh, it's a small country. It's about the size of New Jersey. And the area that abuts the, the Adriatic Sea down in the far southwest is a, a region that has a place name called Kras, K-R-A-S. Um, and it's highlighted here or outlined here in black. Uh, and the, the region actually um, is crossed by the border between Italy and Slovenia through here. Um, and, and so in Slovene, the, the word is cross. In Italian, the word is carso. And in English, it's the classical karst. Um, and how did that term uh, change from being a Slovene term cross to uh, what we now call karst? Well, it was all a result of the um, early, early work when defining it. Um, the, uh, the language of science at the time was German. And so the Slovene word kras was essentially Germanicized into uh, the word we use today internationally, which is karst. And it's a place name, which is important because in terms of the definition, uh, it's really defined by the features that were found in that place. And so some of those features in Slovenia are just really dramatic, beautiful, uh, uh, deep valleys of collapsed uh, features in the limestone, uh, big caves that flow through with natural bridges and, and streams flowing out of them, uh, huge springs, and of course caves, lovely caves. Um, here in Virginia, oh, and one more thing, if you were to look at the surface of this landscape, um, and this is using a technology called LIDAR, which is essentially putting a laser scanner at, over the landscape from an airplane. You can, you can see the kind of uh, uh, pockmarking of closed depressions and sinkholes that occur across the landscape in the classical karst here. Uh, here's a highway running through for scale and some smaller roads to show you the, uh, the number and the scale of these, of these sinkholes. Uh, here in Virginia, we actually have some really dramatic karst ourselves. I'm sure most of you are familiar with the iconic natural bridge, uh, now, now a state park. Um, this is Falling Spring Falls out near Covington, Virginia, uh, a fabulous karst feature, which I'll talk about a little bit later. Um, and of course, the natural tunnel down in far southwestern Virginia, also a state park. And because we have LIDAR uh, imagery also available for Virginia, we can look at areas such as the Cedars, which is a protected natural area. It's a conservation area in southwestern Virginia. And we can see also we have really world-class karst here in Virginia. Uh, some, some might say on par with some of the features that you find in the classical karst of Slovenia and Italy. So how does karst form? Well, since the word is actually the name of a place, let's talk a little bit about process. Um, and uh, the process is essentially a chemical one. Um, the limestone is made up of calcium carbonate and carbonates, whether the, the metal is calcium or magnesium or sodium, they dissolve fairly readily in water because of uh, this reaction over here. Um, when you take carbon dioxide and you mix it into water, it'll dissolve and it'll create this uh, right here in green. This is H2CO3, that's carbonic acid. It's dissolved, but it's a, it's a very weak acid. Um, and it, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's acidic enough to dissolve the carbonate rock over time and put it into solution. And so that's really the process when you take calcium carbonate or limestone, you add water and CO2, you break it down into calcium and bicarbonate in, in solution. Uh, and so you basically have now dissolved the rock and that's happening uh, really quite aggressively at the Earth's surface, not just because the atmosphere has CO2, but also the soil zone has a lot of CO2 that's created by all the organisms that are respiring and breathing out like we are. They're breathing out CO2 into the soils 
And so the, the concentration of carbon dioxide in soils can be hundreds of times what it is in the atmosphere. Um, and so at that surface of the limestone and the soil, there's just an awful lot of dissolution happening. And we call that uh, surface the epikarst or the skin of the karst. And uh, over time, water will seep through and down through those fractures. And if it goes deep enough, it may encounter a cave. Uh, if the water enters into a cave, then uh, the CO2 that's accumulated in the water from the soil zone actually degasses. It's like opening the top of a soda pop bottle. Um, and as it degasses, it loses its acidity and it loses the ability to hold the minerals in solution anymore. And so you will have them precipitating out again as the beautiful formations we often see in caves, stalactites, stalagmites, and other forms of speleothems. A uh, speleothem is a term that means a cave mineral formation in general. Um, here's a, a lovely cartoon diagram of what a typical karst terrain might look like. Um, limestone areas, because they, they tend to uh, have this accumulation of sediment uh, atop the bedrock, are all over the world, they're, they're, they're fairly uh, good agricultural lands. Um, that is where the, where the sediment has not been removed. In, in some places, including the classical karst of Slovenia, um, all the trees were cut down to help build the city of Venice. They were pounded into the mudflats in, in the lagoon of the Adriatic Sea, uh, atop which the city of Venice was built. And when they removed the trees, uh, there was just uh, centuries of soil erosion. And so the word cross actually comes from a, a word that means barren stony land. And so there, the landscape was essentially denuded uh, and you had just bare rock, that, that very pitted, pinnacled, sharp surface exposed everywhere and it was very difficult to travel across. So that's how it got the place named Cross. Um, here uh, in this image right now, the, the sediment is a nice blanket covering the limestone underneath, but even in Virginia, we can go out and walk across the landscape and see the bare rock at the surface. Um, but where it's covered, it's very good agricultural land. Um, and the, the, the downside, in a sense, is that the sediments overlying this pitted surface of the epicarst um, often can give rise to sinkholes. Um, the ones that we are most concerned about are what we call cover collapse sinkholes, where a void that might start, like over here in the picture on the far left, you see this hidden void in the soil because sediments are being piped down into the voids in the bedrock, almost like sand in an hourglass, and leaving behind this open void that might eventually propagate to the surface and collapse. And when that happens, it can happen suddenly or slowly. Um, if it happens slowly over time, like in an hour, hourglass, you can get this bowl-shaped depression. And it may be a convenient place for people to use to dump things they don't want anymore, um, which is really not a good idea. And the reason is um, because there's direct connection between the bedrock uh, at, the, at the surface and the water that occurs at the surface and flows down into the subsurface. And so um, sometimes human activities at the surface, such as putting trash into sinkholes or building a leaking septic tank or a gas tank onto the bedrock surface will cause acute groundwater contamination um, because everything is sort of well connected by fractures in the rock. You can have water flowing down through a, a contaminated site into, uh, the, into a, a pathway that could lead it to a spring or through a cave uh, very rapidly across many miles in some cases. Um, and also people might be tapping into those groundwater flow paths as domestic water supplies. And so they may be tapping into a, a contaminated source un, unknowingly. So karst areas are really quite sensitive um, in terms of the, the water quantity and quality. And we'll talk a little bit about that in Virginia in a minute. So let's zoom in on Virginia for a second here. Um, this is a map depicting various types of rock that host carbonates and evaporites um, that host karst in Virginia. And I'm really, uh, you can divide that up according to the physiographic provinces. Um, we've got the coastal plain, out here in the east, where mostly these are buried um, carbonate rich sediments that are shell beds um, that may house some voids, but they're really not expressing much on the surface in terms of karst, and there really aren't any caves to, to speak of. 
Um, in the Piedmont, there are um, metamorphic rocks and limestones that do host some caves. They're, they're fairly small, um, but there's some notable karst up here near the town of Leesburg. Um, the Blue Ridge uh, is mostly other kinds of rock that don't uh, dissolve that readily in water, so they don't really have much in the way of karst. Um, but the Great Valley is where we find uh, the, the, the um, dominantly the karst features in Virginia. And then further out in the valley and ridge, of course, we have uh, huge cave systems um, that are kind of confined to these thin zones um, in, in valleys in between the ridges. And uh, we'll touch on that a little bit later. Mostly we're going to focus, though, on the Shenandoah Valley. And here we are, our lovely Shenandoah Valley. You can see uh, in this relief map here that it is something of a depression with the Blue Ridge rising above it and the Valley and Ridge and other smaller ridges rising above it out here. And uh, this is a feature everyone should be familiar with in the center of the Shenandoah Valley. Uh, it's Massanutten Mountain. Um, since we're being hosted by Newmarket Library, I thought I'd put Newmarket on the map so we can all uh, have a common point of reference. Um, and there is Massanutten Mountain. It's, a, it's quite a lovely feature. You can even see it's from space. Um, and it stands proud above the landscape because it's composed primarily, what's holding up these ridges are quartz-rich sandstones. And there's uh, shales and, and limestones on either side, which is why uh, it stands up and, and the, the softer shales and the soluble limestones and bullet stones, they, they, uh, they erode away. And so we have this wonderful uh, topography. We're going to take a look now, uh, looking towards the southern end of Massanutten Mountain, and tilt it up here in Google Earth. There it is, Massanutten Mountain. And you might notice that it looks kind of like a canoe or a trough in here. I'm going to talk a little about that structure there. Now these are some of the geologic maps that Steve Whitmire has put together with some of his students from JMU. And uh, the, the colors that you see draped on the land surface here, these are all indicating different geologic units. Um, most of these from here on over to the left here, these are our carbonates of different sorts. From here over to the right, also carbonates. And in the middle, this is mostly shales and sandstones. Um, and you can kind of see that that color pattern repeats itself on either side. Well, that's because of the way the rocks were uh, bent and broken and folded and faulted uh, due to the mountain building of the Appalachian Mountains. Um, essentially, and I, I'm not going to go into great detail on that. If you want to learn more about that, there are great vi YouTube videos by my colleagues, Steve Whitmire and, and Callan Bentley from Northern Virginia Community College. But in a nutshell, you had the uh, hard crystalline rocks of the Blue Ridge being pushed by continental collisions uh, up against the sedimentary rocks that now that are underlying the Shenandoah Valley. And because of that collision, these rocks were folded and faulted and, and crumpled, much like if you were pushing on the edge of a rug on a hardwood floor and you could see the rug uh, folding in front of you. And as a result, um, the center of the Shenandoah Valley is, is a, is a trough-like fold that we call a syncline. And in, in a broader sense, from, from edge of the valley to the other edge, we call this a synclinorium. So it's a, it's a broad um, trough-like fold with some smaller folds contained within it. So we call that the Massanutten synclinorium, and that underlies the Shenandoah Valley. Here's a cross section of that synclinorium. Now we're only looking at um, about uh, um, a few, maybe a thousand feet below the surface here and above the surface, just to give you a sense of scale, not terribly deep. But at the surface, you can see that there's soil development, like I discussed before, with some of the dissolution of the rock. And then water that's flowing down through fractures in the rock and, and causing solution along the way um, to, to open up the pathways for uh, rapid flow in, in the bedrock. Um, and that's essentially what's giving rise to our terrain, which has sinkholes and sinking streams and caves. And uh, because of the structure and the faulting, water also rises from depth and feeds onto the surface as springs. 
Um, and as it's rising up, it's mixing in some areas um, and causing additional dissolution in the subsurface and often creating caves. Um, and uh, we'll talk a little bit about the, the caves as well and how that is expressed in the morphology of the caves. But first, we want to ask the question, where did all this limestone rock come from in the first place? How did it even get here? Well, to answer that question, we have to go way back in geologic time, all the way back to about 500 million years ago in the Cambrian, late Cambrian period. And at that time, the continent of North America was um, located not too far, um, well, pretty much on the equator and between um, the equator and 30 degrees south latitude. And um, that's a little hard to visualize because uh, you kind of have to turn the whole continent 90 degrees. Um, but that's essentially where, where it was. And that latitude is, is as, as you can tell, it's subtropical and, and can be fairly uh, hot and, and depending on the climate could be dry as well. Let's zoom in on where Virginia actually lies. And you can kind of see that it's, it's sort of covered by water, but this light blue is indicating the depth of the water. It gets darker blue as it's deeper. So we're sort of in an area where uh, it's fairly shallow water um, and maybe some carbonate-like islands there. To compare, we can look at where 30 degrees south latitude is today. And the best place to, to look for an, an analogous setting is on uh, Australia. Here's 30 degrees south latitude today. And in Australia, especially Western Australia, it's a very dry continent. And out here, there are some really interesting areas where we can see evidence of what used to be dominating life forms on Earth in the Cambrian period. And these are microbial mats or buildups called stromatolites. I'm gonna zoom in here to Shark Bay, um, the Hamlin Pools in Shark Bay, Western Australia, where you can actually see living stromatolites. These are, these are mats of um, cyanobacteria, blue-green algae, that um, uh, sequester fine sediments and, and they get solidified uh, into hard rock and build up these interesting, strange, eerie looking mounds. Um, and if you, if you could, you could project your mind's eye back to the Cambrian period. This would be what most of the continent uh, edge of North America looked like where we are in Virginia. How do we know this? Well, we know this because we can go to look at the rocks that are exposed in Virginia today, and we can see fossilized stromatolites. And this one happens to be from uh, an area I was mapping in near Briary Branch, Virginia. Not too far away from the Hamlin Pools is uh, a place called Lake Clifton, which hosts another type of microbialite or microbial buildup of calcium carbonate to build limestone, which are called thrombolites. Um, this is an a, uh, interpretive sign at, the, uh, at Lake Clifton in Australia, and it says, are they rocks? <laughs> they might look like rocks, but they're really microbial communities. And these microbial communities are growing by photosynthesis, um, and then they're obtaining calcium carbonate from the water to build up the structures that you see uh, along the coast or the edge of the lakeshore here and extend out further. It's a very shallow lake. Um, here's some photos up close of the thrombolites. The only difference between a thrombolite and a stromatolite is that the thrombolites tend to be uh, a little less well layered. And then these are some thrombolites and, uh, from a uh, formation called the Elbrick Formation near Clover Hill, Virginia. So these are our best clues as to what the environment was like that built up all of this limestone and this is early in uh, the history of the deposition of limestone in the Shenandoah Valley, Cambrian and Ordovician time. So again, you can project in, into your mind's eye what, the, uh, what Virginia might have looked like, except for the fact that all the plants that you see growing in the background here, they wouldn't have existed because land plants hadn't evolved yet in, in, these, in this time period. They came about more in the Silurian. Okay. Um, so back to Virginia, um, this is a bit of a complicated diagram, but I'll just walk you through it. On the right here is 
a stratigraphic column or essentially a diagram depicting all the buildup of sedimentary rock that occurs in, uh, in the Shenandoah Valley and, and nearby areas of the Valley and Ridge in Virginia. And really what we're interested in are down here, the carbonates that exist. And like I said, they're mostly Cambrian and Ordovician in age. Um, the different colors here indicate the different rock units that we've named. And on the map here, they're also color coded so you can see where they're exposed on the surface. And they're all, uh, as we discussed, they're deformed. So they're folded and faulted um, into the present state. If you were to look at the total thickness, you would see that it's about four kilometers, which is, is quite remarkable. It's a, it's a great thickness of carbonate buildup that occurred over millions of years. Um, the, this red line here would indicate, if you were to cut a cross section down and lift it up and look at it on its side, you would have a profile something like this. And you could see that these colors are repeating themselves because of the thrusting, there's one, uh, one sheet of rock of sediments that um, rode up and uh, on top of the other during the compression that built up these mountains. And so actually the whole package is duplicated to some extent. So you have quite a thickness of, of, of carbonate rock and other sediments uh, underlying the Shenandoah Valley. I'm gonna zoom in real quick on the Newmarket limestone since Newmarket is hosting our event. It, uh, we name these rock formations after localities, um, typically place names that are, you know, human place names um, uh, like cities and towns or physiographic features. Um, the New Market's named for New Market, Virginia. The Conigachig, for example, is named for Conigachig Creek in Maryland. Um, but those are the places, they're named, they're named for those places because that's where the rock is typically very well exposed and, and can be described. And here's a, an example of the Newmarket limestone near Broadway, Virginia. Um, and this is a special limestone because it's, it's valued for, for its purity. It's almost 98% pure calcium carbonate. And so many of the quarries that you'll see up and down the Shenandoah Valley are mining this particular rock unit. And they call it a chemical limestone um, because it's used to create derivatives of calcium carbonate. Uh, one of which might be an antacid tablet if you've ever taken a Tums, uh, you've probably eaten uh, calcium carbonate and may have even come from a quarry uh, in, in Virginia. And typically, like you'll see at the surface, as I mentioned before, in, in, uh, where you have uh, the soil stripped away, you can see those small dissolutional features that lead down into the deeper subsurface exposed in the limestone. Um, and this one actually contains different types of fossils. Uh, these, are, these are some cephalopods. Um, but we, we can infer a different uh, depositional environment for this rock because it has different types of sedimentary features. And the Newmarket limestone is actually a lot like what you would find today around the Bahama Banks. Um, the Bahamas are very low-lying islands surrounded by a uh, shelf that extends far, far out from the land, the exposed land, and it's really shallow, maybe a, a few to 10 meters depth until it hit the edge of the, the platform and then it drops off into the deeper ocean. But when you're on that shelf, most of what you've got is a carbonate factory. You're just building carbonate sediments up um, all the time in great abundance. And that's essentially the type of environment that the Newmarket limestone would have been deposited within um, back in the, in the Ordovician. So something like the Bahama Banks, a uh, little different than the Shenandoah Valley today, but um, we can always imagine we're there. So the star is again representing, the yellow star here is representing New Market. Um, we'll just sort of follow it through time now as the continents move and eventually in the, um, Carboniferous and, and late in the Pennsylvanian, the uh, Appalachian Mountains start to be built as the world's continents came together in a massive megacontinent or supercontinent called Pangaea. Um, persisted for some time into the Permian, and you can see now this this suture right here would represent the ancestral Appalachian Mountains. Then Pangaea started to break up in the Mesozoic in Triassic and Jurassic periods and, and small uh, rift basins were forming in Virginia. 
like the Culpeper Basin. Eventually in the Cretaceous, uh, we start to see remnant, uh, the vestiges of, uh, or, or the, the beginnings of our modern map of the continents around the globe today, um, but sea levels were still really quite high in the Cretaceous and there was an inland sea out in the Western US. And this just uh, incidentally is why we see so much karst in the US, primarily because of the Cambrian Ordovician platform and then also a lot of uh, buildup of carbonates in the Cretaceous. Finally, we're in our modern, uh, more or less recent time, geologic time, the Cenozoic, and uh, that's where we are today. But sea levels in this particular um, image are still fairly high. You can see all of the Florida platform is still covered with, with ocean water. And um, Florida is essentially an entire, entirely um, one, one big buildup of carbonate rock, not unlike the Bahama Banks, which is one reason it has so much karst as well. So just real quick, uh, it's a cartoon again about how the landscape may have evolved. In the late Triassic, we, were, we had the Appalachian Mountains. They were, they were built and they were um, being eroded now because they're, um, the, the mountain building event had, had actually ended and, and Pangaea was starting to break apart. But they were uh, quite high mountains. Uh, some would say they had rivaled the Himalayas in, in height at uh, one time. Um, and the Great Valley would have been in this area underlain by the limestones, which are often depicted in geologic maps or cross sections as a sort of brick-like pattern. Um, later in time during the Cretaceous, from Jurassic to Cretaceous, there would have been a lot of erosion, perhaps not to this extent, but this is again a, a cartoon. We do, we do have some evidence though that the Great Valley filled in to a great extent with sediments from the derived from the erosion of the surrounding ridges. And then now we're close to our present condition where um, the resistant rocks are showing up as ridges and the softer rocks in between the shales and limestones are, are weathered down into valleys. And the large expanse of limestone and shale underlying the Shenandoah Valley yields our Appalachian Great Valley. And the Great Valley actually extends from New York State all the way down to Alabama. So we have uh, Cambrian and Ordovician carbonate rocks extending all the way down through here. The, uh, the evidence that we have for the, um, the development of karst on the present land surface um, comes in the way of the features that we see, the sinkholes and the caves. Um, and how do we get any kind of sense of how old they are? Well, we have to have something within them that we can rely on to give us an accurate age. Um, and that can be kind of hard because um, open space, you can't date. So something has to fill in the open space. And that's something that whatever fills it in, we have to find some means of getting an age on it. Um, in the case of the Great Valley, fortunately, we have an instance of an area. Well, I'll get to there in a second. Out further in the west, uh, some of the same age rocks host um, some sinkholes that have fossils in them. And the fossils indicate, indicate uh, ages as, as early as the early Pliocene, which is about 5 million years. And this is out in Indiana, in the Pipe Creek sinkhole. And here we have a similar site in, uh, in, the, in the Appalachian Great Valley, just south of Virginia, this is in Tennessee. Um, but it's called the Gray Fossil Site at Gray, Tennessee. And it's a, it's a really marvelous find. It was discovered in 2000 when they were putting in a road. Um, they cut through a hill of clay and found all these fossils within the clay. So they stopped construction, they moved the road, and this became now an excavation and a museum. Um, and if I, I, as I said, I, I think everyone should, should take, a, take a trip down there and, and visit. Um, and you'll get a glimpse into the past of what not just uh, the Gray site looked like, but probably the whole Great Valley extending up into Virginia and into the Shenandoah Valley may have looked like in the past. Um, essentially, some of these fossils were uh, really remarkable for their, the fauna that they found, uh, rhinoceroses and alligators and tapirs and saber-toothed cats and a, a red panda the kind of uh, organisms that you don't find in Virginia today, but may have existed in a, in a more tropical time period. 
Um, and in fact, we do think the climate at that time period uh, was um, much wetter and much warmer. Um, here's sort of a, a, a diagram depicting how this site may have evolved through time. So early and then later and then later. Um, and at the, the sediments that filled in, so these are, these are deeper um, karst features or sinkholes or um, some might call them cenotes because they had filled with very fine grained clays, which meant they were, they were probably filled with water, stagnant water. And uh, within the clays is where all the animal fossils were found near the surface. And so the uh, age of this feature has been dated to about 4 million years. And that's our best estimate on the age of the fill in these sinkholes. But again, the sinkhole had to have been there before it was filled in. And we don't really know how long that may have been, um, but certainly older than, than 4 million years. That's not to say that all the sinkholes in the Shenandoah Valley are ancient. Um, we do have quite a few that are modern and, and opening today. Um, here are a few that are photos that I've taken over the years in my field work. Um, here's one in particular I thought was interesting, uh, a little hole between some roots of a trees and I looked down into it and it was just a void that went straight down for like 20 feet. Um, and these are not uncommon. Sometimes you'll find an open throat um, underneath some exposed bedrock and sometimes you'll just see a bowl shaped depression. Um, here's some other examples of uh, open voids in, in exposed bedrock. Um, not very large, you might not think they go anywhere because they're not terribly explorable in terms of caves. But sometimes we'll do uh, targeted dye tracing where we'll put a non-toxic dye into one of these sinkholes to trace the water pathways, the groundwater flow paths. And we did this one year out here near Winchester and the water traveled um, about 100 meters before it went to a well in a, in a nearby house. And it wasn't this house, it was in the other direction. But um, it went to the well and came out the faucet, it turned, the, uh, turned the homeowner's water, water supply a nice fluorescent green. Um, now, they weren't too pleased about that, but it did illustrate the, uh, the really intimate connection between that sinkhole or that hole in the, in the land surface, which, by the way, was uh, within a, a pasture that, that cattle had been using. And so they were really, the, the people who own this well, had a, uh, a direct connection to the land surface in their drinking water supply. Fortunately, they had some filtration that they had already built in, but this is not uncommon in karst areas. Um, you can hear case story, case study after case study of, of dyes going in the ground and coming out of people's wells um, when you're living in karst, and it just shows the sensitivity of the, the, the uh, water resources to the land activities on the surface. Um, here's a place some of you might be familiar with. It's Hupps Hill uh, in Stroudsburg, Virginia. Meredith mentioned this as a site to go visit if you want to see some nice sinkholes and if you want to see a, a, a site on our cave and karst trail. Um, this is Crystal Caverns, a, a little blind map of Crystal Caverns, which is currently closed to the public, but is a, used to be a tour cave. Um, and I just highlight here some of the closed depressions, the sinkholes, and how they're lining up along uh, linear zones, which are related to fractures in the rock. So uh, we can almost get a sense of where water might flow in the subsurface um, by mapping out some of these fractures and the patterns of the, of the fractures across the landscape, in addition to the, the overall structure of the geology, like the folding that I mentioned earlier. We're going to just take a quick look at one of these sinkholes here now up against the, uh, the quarry. Um, it's now the quarry is inactive and there's a lake. Um, but this is a, a colleague of mine, Dave Weary, standing in a sinkhole that used to be uh, a big trash dump for a, a house that wasn't far from here. And again, this is not the kind of thing we would want to do today um, simply because of what I just illustrated that the water that goes down into these uh, isolated features can travel quickly underground unfiltered and might come out someone's well. Uh, here's a view looking across the quarry at the wall and you can see the uh, solutional features in the quarry wall right there. And the, the solution really tends to take place at intersections between fractures that are 
the bedding of the rock or the initial horizontal layering and the vertical fracturing or joints, um, which are extensional fractures that form during compression of the, of the rocks during mountain building. And here I'm standing on top of one, um, probably not the smartest place to be, but uh, there you can see where a void might be held up and the soil above it is just held up by the cohesion in the soil, which could give way and if it does, then you'll have a, a sudden collapse of a, of a car, uh, cover collapse sinkhole. Um, the fractures in the rock also guide cave passages. This is Shenandoah Caverns, a, a map of uh, the cave from above, and uh, some measurements of strikes and dips of bedding and joints, um, the orientation of the planar fractures that exist in the cave. And I'll just illustrate one example here um, from, from the cave where you can see the bedding plane you can see the original layering of the sediments as they were laid down, as I mentioned on that ancient seafloor. And they, they actually form partings or fractures that water will preferentially flow along and open up into caves. Um, in this case, it's a 45 degree dip from the horizontal, which is what this symbol is indicating. And uh, a joint fracture that's cutting across it, and then the cave passage itself uh, opened up uh, near the intersection of those fractures. And the, my, my favorite example to show the, uh, to illustrate the control of rock fracturing on cave formation is, is Grand Caverns. Uh, it's a tour cave. I'm sure most of you are familiar with it, if you're familiar with tour caves in the Shenandoah Valley. And uh, here's a line map of the cave in red um, on top of a LIDAR derived elevation surface, which is showing you in detail the topography. You might notice this sort of light colored little ridge right here. That is a ridge of sandstone in the Conigachig formation, which has been folded. And uh, also, uh, be, and up against it, you see sinkholes forming on either side and the carbonate on either side. But the map of Grand Caverns shows the fracturing that's related to that um, folding and deformation of the rock. And it's a, essentially a, a combination of um, subvertical bedding on this side of the cave to almost flat lying bedding and vertical jointing in this side of the cave, which gives you uh, the passage here. So in, uh, if you're familiar with looking at cave maps, you'll notice that they, they have cross sections occasionally drawn in to show you what the profile of the passage might look like. And here you can see the bedding or the, the passageways are following the bedding almost vertical. When you get down to this area, it's almost, uh, it's more shallowly dipping into um, uh, the, the nose or the, the, the axis of that fold. The other thing you'll notice in Grand Caverns, if you're ever uh, taking a tour, this is a still water room in the cave and you'll see these lines. And these lines indicate ancient water levels when the cave had been filled with water and, and the water was stagnant and precipitating calcium carbonate almost like a bathtub ring uh, within the passageways of the cave. And they, these exist throughout the cave and they give us a, some sense of how the cave formed. Um, in this case, Grand Caverns never really had a stream flowing through it. Water was just rising from below up into these fractures and opening up the cave passage. Probably periodically, it would flood and drain and flood and drain up and down, up and down and leave these, um, these water levels for us as markers to go and investigate and to, to try to understand the timing of those events. It's kind of interesting that the cave never had a stream flowing through it. It doesn't seem to have had a stream flowing through it, um, even though the South River is right on the doorstep of Grand Caverns. And there are a couple other caves in here, Madison Saltpeter Cave and Steggers Fissure. Um, I'm gonna touch on it, but I'm gonna let Will, if he, if he will talk about the biology some more, he'll, he might uh, give you some more insight into those caves. Again, here's an ancient pool level um, in Grand Caverns indicating uh, how water has risen and fell, fallen down in, in the cave. Now, the waters that are in the cave, they, in order to, to leave this bathtub ring or this deposit of calcium carbonate, the waters had to have been very rich in dissolved rock. And we see that happening not just in caves, but also in springs on the surface. Uh, in many cases you see marl, travertine deposits throughout um, Virginia, many of which were mined for ag lime 
Um, up here near Winchester, there is a, a fairly well-known site. Um, this map shows, here's the city of Winchester with uh, Highway 81 running past it. And the yellow areas are where the marl or the calcium carbonate that's dropping out of the spring-fed streams is filling in the valleys. Uh, and they used to mine it out for ag lime. Um, in some places, it forms beautiful travertine dammed waterfalls, like here down near Spout Run in, uh, in Clark County. And um, the, as I mentioned, these are all spring-fed streams. So the water is, is getting the carbonate from dissolution of the rock. It's flowing out onto the surface by springs, losing CO2, and dropping out the minerals again as these deposits. And Almost invariably, these springs are controlled by faults or these black lines on the geologic map here as uh, weaknesses in the rock where water can rise up from below. And David Hubbard, who used to work for the Virginia Geological Survey, um, did a nice paper describing that process where you have water rising along a fault zone here. You can see the broken rock and you can see the pathways along uh, in, in the rock that are solutionally enlarged. By the rising water and the water spills out onto the surface and deposits the calcium carbonate as uh, travertine dams and marl deposits ponded behind them. Uh, I mentioned Madison Cave. It has a much greater vertical extent than horizontal extent and if you go down into the bottom passage where you find the, uh, the pool you will see calcite rafts that have formed on the surface of the pool again indicating the rich dissolved carbonate content in the groundwater, uh, which is permeating um, the, the aquifers of the Shenandoah Valley, very rich in, in, in uh, calcium carbonate content, which is important for hosting Madison Cave isopod and uh, important for its biology. And I'm not gonna say any more about that because I wanna pass it off to Will when he has uh, his, his talk coming up soon. Um, and I'll just end it there and say, Here's a, here's a view of the Shenandoah Valley. This is Mole Hill outside of Harrisonburg looking back towards Massanutten Mountain. And if you're interested in what lies beneath, you might be surprised when you go into caves to find that it's a wonderful world underground. Thank you very much. Um, be happy to take a question or two. Dan, that was, that was lots of great information. Beautiful, beautiful photos as well. Does anyone have any questions for Dan? All right. Well, I think you probably did a great job of covering the subject. And um, if you are like me and think of your best questions about five minutes from now, you're welcome to enter them on the on the chat screen and we can we can catch up with them later. But uh, you've got some, uh, well, let's see. Um, one question on the chat bar is, is Endless Caverns similar to Shenandoah Caverns? Is Endless similar to Shenandoah? Yes. Uh, well, that's a very good question. Um, I'm in, in, in some sense, yes. Both were formed by the dissolution of the rock um, by moving groundwater. Uh, Shenandoah has a somewhat different plan, uh, map pattern. It's more of a maze-like cave, um, although there's some evidence that there was stream flow through the cave. Um, but uh, Endless is, is much more of a, of a stream-like cave. Um, so it seems to have formed not just by the rising and falling of groundwater, like I mentioned in Grand Caverns, but more by stream flow through the cave. Um, probably there was a combination though in Endless. Hey Dan. Yeah. You've got a really good uh, viewpoint there on your screen. You can kind of show where Endless is in the valley sort of relative to where, uh, to where Grand is or to where uh, Shenandoah is. So like Endless is over at the base of the Massanutten. Yeah. Right, yep. It's, uh, it's on the flank of the Massanutten Mountain, whereas Shadow is well out into the middle of the valley. Thank you, Will. And because of that, Endless had uh, the, the limestone that was exposed on the, on the flank of, the, of, the, of Massanutten Mountain um, was receiving a lot of water from flow off, the, off of the sides of the, the, the ridges of the mountain. And so 
Also, because of the, um, the alluvial material or the, or the detritus that's generated by the erosion of the sandstones, Endless was covered by um, a good bit of uh, alluvial material, sand and gravel that formed a, sort of like a sponge-like aquifer of acidic water because there's no carbonate up in those, in those sediments so that um, it could feed its streams that were pretty aggressive to the limestone versus what you get out in the valley where most of the groundwater is already rich in carbonate. 